All right. I want to introduce uh, Edward Woodford from Zero Hash. He will be talking about uh, bringing BTC to the people, not the people to BTC. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> awesome. All righty. Um, so happy Sunday, everyone. Um, so I actually got involved in crypto in 2015. I actually um, was here as a student, and I bought my first Bitcoin um, at the student center. They had a crypto ATM. Um, so it's great to be back. Um, just one thing I want to point out. It's, I think it's really, really important. One thing that we haven't spoken today, we've spoken about tech. We should also think about what we are building with that tech. Um, so I'm not going to go into details, but I'm not personally comfortable with a number of sponsors at this event. I think it's really, really important with MIT and how that name is used. And as an alum, I'm very, very passionate about that point. So I just think everybody here should just be conscious of what we're building, what we're trying to do. Um, and trying to align the right people in the right room. So my talk is around uh, bringing Bitcoin to people. So I think that there's this false paradigm with a lot of financial services companies that the blockchain is good, but crypto is bad. And this is ultimately a false dichotomy. So if you're looking at, for example, tokenized assets, yesterday we were talking about real world assets. We were talking about potential around stable coins being built on um, crypto. Um, ultimately, this relies on um, the underlying um, asset that is being used to pay, for example, for gas, if you're talking about Ethereum, or for example, transaction fees uh, for Bitcoin. You can't see this here, but I think uh, you can see up here. I think one of the most interesting papers that's come out recently is this paper, LRC20, um, and it's talking about the ability to tokenize on Lightning. So the ability, for example, to create a stable coin on, on, on Lightning. Obviously, uh, with the halving, you've now got runes. And I think that this is really, really important technological development as we talk about the utility of this technology as an asset class. And I'll get a bit more into that um, later on. So what is ZeroHash? Um, ZeroHash, we think of the world in terms of a value engine. Um, you know, we, we, we think that these three worlds of stables, crypto, and fiat all need to intersect, and there needs to be a seamless way to move these pieces. Often as well, when you're talking about stables, for example, if you're talking about a stable coin that is actually tokenized on the Bitcoin network, um, you, 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 it's almost, it's, it cannot be separated from, from crypto, but from people's minds, they separate these three things out. And we, for example, provide a seamless rail to move fiat, i.e. US dollars, Euro, GBP, into stable coins, whether that be USDC, USDT, as well as crypto, whether it be Bitcoin, or paying for the gas or transaction fees associated with the movement of a stable coin. I think really importantly as well, we prefer to use the term stables versus stable coin. And the reason for that is we're really, really excited about, for example, the progress that's been done around tokenized money market funds. So if you, for example, look at Biddle, um, it's a really, really interesting uh, tokenized money market fund by BlackRock, still very, very early in its evolution. But one of the things that we think is quite interesting as you think about the purpose of stables, the ability to move things 24-7, 365, um, if you're giving people the ability to earn interest on that, so if you're a financial firm and you're locking up large amounts of capital, the ability to earn interest is really interesting. So we prefer to use this term stables. So this goes back to my point around the, the paper that I presented on LRC20. Um, we think that Bitcoin is in a really, really unique position to actually disrupt a lot of the technology and, um, and actually have real world use cases and utility. We just heard a conversation on mining, for example, and the utility of, um, of, of crypto and the actual transaction fees was a really interesting um, point. But I think when you look at Bitcoin, we are in, at this unique inflection point. So if you actually look at, for example, real world, um, if, if you say, okay, we're really interested in Bitcoin as a, or, or, or crypto as a means of transferring value across border, if you actually look at the data, stable coins predominate still in large parts of the world, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Venezuela. Um, but what I think is really, really interesting here around Bitcoin is that next wave of evolution. So Bitcoin is the most widespread distributed infrastructure out there that we have in crypto. Um, obviously, the cost 
element, if you've been on uh, X over the last two days, I think most of my feed is full of the cost of moving Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's going to be progress there, but separately, obviously, you have separate innovations around Lightning that we're really, really excited about. We're going to be launching Lightning next week um, at zero hash. And then what we're also interested about is fungibility technology. So when you combine these three pieces together, um, it positions Bitcoin as a technology in a really, really unique place. It gives distribution, low cost, and the ability to move fungible assets. And we think those three things together uh, places Bitcoin as a technology and an asset class in a really, really unique position. So flipping the script, I want to dive into kind of, kind of a couple of real world applications that we're powering today with Bitcoin technology. Um, these are just three of many, but we're really excited about the global payroll use case, um, the remittance and payouts use case, and payments. So here's a survey um, that we did. We're actually going to be releasing at, this, at the end of this month, but just a little bit of a prelude. We did a survey uh, with an independent firm called Sentient, and we worked to um, have, have a questionnaire with 2,500 freelancers across the US, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and the UAE. Um, and if you look at the data, 35% of these freelancers are already um, leveraging um, and have received income or payments from clients in the form of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and USDC. So we think that this places um, crypto in a really unique place. The reasons that people are interested in this, I don't think I need to convince this room about the value. But for example, if you're in a country where the volatility of that currency, where there's a high deflationary pressure on that currency, I think that's really, really one of the big drivers. Speed, velocity, um, that can be used as well. So this is the key drivers. So global payroll is an area that we're very, very focused on. The value prop of this, if you actually apply this to what we call the value engine, effectively you have a firm, for example, here in the US. They want to pay in dollars, right? They want to be able to close their books in dollars. What we handle is the ability to convert that fiat into, for example, Bitcoin and send that out um, in a seamless fashion in a very, very quick time, of period, time period. Um, this is already happening. So we'll be announcing a couple of, of the largest payroll providers are leveraging zero hash to offer this to all of their end freelancers and contractors. Um, but if you actually look at, um, for example, Deal, Deal was actually founded by MIT alum as well. 4% of payouts on their platform is now done through crypto. So this is not a hypothetical. This is a real thing being done today. And one of the things that we're really focused on is reducing that friction to allow that to occur uh, through any platform. Um, remittances and payouts. So what we're really excited about is thinking about Bitcoin um, as a network of networks. And by that we mean that effectively it's an ability to connect two real-time payment mechanisms. So one use case, for example, would be in the US, there is now a concept of RTP, real-time payments, um, that's live. Um, there's going to be a lot more innovation in the US around a real-time mechanism of moving money. Um, effectively, what can be done now on this network of networks is transferring assets uh, from uh, the US using RTP, converting that into Bitcoin, then converting that Bitcoin into Mexican peso with a local liquidity provider, and then sending that out on another real-time payment mechanism. So in uh, Mexico, for example, you have the SPI, in Brazil, you have PIX. And so this real-time mechanism across border is something that we think is really, really fascinating. And again, this is not a hypothetical. 5% uh, of the USD Mexico remittance corridor today is leveraging crypto in some mechanism. And you know, there's a lot of startups out there, some that we're really um, excited, one that I'm really excited by, for example, um, is actually a group uh, that has a team here uh, founded by some really interesting folks, um, mixed team from MIT and Harvard um, at management level, um, and um, it's a group called Felix Pago. Um, really, really interesting. You can do payments via Felix, uh, via uh, WhatsApp, uh, and leveraging on the back end uh, stable coins. But that just gives you some indication of stable coins and crypto being used as a mechanism today. Public MoneyGram, Google MoneyGram Crypto. If you look up Western Union Crypto. These groups are really using this as a network of networks already today, and we are still very much in the early innings. 
So you can see here a visual representation of how this can occur. This is exactly how long it can take. And this is the beauty, right? You can get a dollar from someone's account to a Mexican peso account in under 10 seconds. And that is pretty extraordinary, not only on the individual perspective, um, but also from an institutional perspective. And speed is one value prop that is provided. Obviously, cost is another that's been spoken about quite a bit. Um, payments. If you look here, um, once you get Bitcoin into the hands of people, people need to spend it. Um, so what I think is really, really interesting around, for example, the evolution of Lightning is the ability to, for example, do subscription payments. So if you're in Argentina and you use Netflix and you use Spotify, it's a really, really, really clunky experience to have to push a payment every single month. Um, the beauty of what can be done with Uma and Lightning, for example, is that it can actually create a Web2 experience, which is really seamless, right? And actually bring that to a Web3 or, or crypto native uh, product. So in terms of payments, that's one big value prop. The other we think is around processing fees and reducing fixed costs. It's actually very expensive for firms to set up local processing. Another is accessing new customers, whether this be, for example, an unbanked audience or what we call frontier markets. So if you look at, for example, companies like Starlink, Starlink is opening up access to the internet for people in pretty remote parts of the world that potentially either aren't banked or potentially uh, from a currency perspective, there's issues. And so we think of Bitcoin and other cryptographic payment methods as a really interesting way to effectively light up this part of the world. Also, you've obviously got faster settlements, and then you've got no FX risk. And the reason that we're focusing as a company, particularly around places like Colombia and Argentina, is if you actually look at the adoption of crypto as a percentage of their customer base, um, it, it's pretty large um, and it's growing. And so these things are reinforcing as well, right? So if you, for example, now can pay people in Bitcoin, the logical next step is they want to be able to spend that Bitcoin. Um, and if you look here, for example, demand from Argentinians and part of their day-to-day -day life, if they had the access to be able to do this, there's real demand. There's also demand from the merchants, which is really the critical unlock here. Merchants, i.e. Netflix, Spotify, you know, pick any group that we know, any brand, um, when they're powering payments from, for example, Argentina, they're losing a huge percentage and their margins, right, get basically compressed. So there's a demand on both sides and that's what we think is really, really interesting around uh, deploying this technology to payments. This is one narrow view that I've tried to give today around the technology's application. Zero hash powers a range of traditional players, crypto native players, for example, MoonPay, many of you may have heard of them. We started working when, with them when they were four people. We now power Stripe's crypto on-ramp product. What we're really excited about is applying those different use cases across our existing customer base and new uh, customers as well. But again, um, I think what's really, really important, this is a very, very narrow view on the world that I presented today. We're also equally excited by crypto as a store of value. Really, really interested around tokenization. Um, you know, the creation of multi-billion dollar crypto native brands as, uh, as well. So we uh, sponsored the um, MIT uh, hackathon that's been going on over the weekend. We're excited to see what people have built. Um, just want to talk a little bit more about Lightning um, and give folks a little bit more context. Um, the people that are building right now uh, are also building on uh, our Lightning and UMA infrastructure that we're rolling out um, later this week. So the value of this is, and I give one example, what does UMA actually mean? You can see here uh, how that actually looks. It effectively really simplifies the ability to send money uh, between, between people. But the beauty of it is simplified UX. You can integrate this infrastructure and payment mechanism with a couple of lines of code, and then lightning fast transactions. So that's really um, everything. Happy to take any questions if we have time.
No questions? That's good. All right. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, th I think when you look at payments, payments means a lot of different things, right? So, for example, Stripe today, if you Google Stripe zero hash, it'll pull up a, a case study that will give you more detail. But effectively, what we do is um, Stripe obviously powers some of the largest merchants and brands. And one of the beautiful things, if, you're, if you buy into the NFT or the Web3 space, is the customer at the end of the day wants to purchase this asset. They want to purchase it, for example, here in the US with US dollars. But for example, if an NFT is deployed on Ethereum, the smart contract needs Ethereum, right? So what is actually happening is that you swipe your credit card, the price of the NFT is actually presented in dollars, but those dollars are then converted into, for example, Ethereum, and is then sent to the smart contract. So that's one product offering that we power, for example, for Stripe. But when we think about payments, we think of it as much broader. We think of it as well, for example, as crypto payouts, right? So the payroll use case. Stripe, uh, Shift4, and others power these sorts of use cases. So what we power today for Stripe, I would say, is a narrow part of the overarching payment story um, and something that we're excited to continue to build, whether that be around payroll, global payouts, uh, for example, even in emergency situations, being able to get uh, funding to people in the event of natural disasters, being able to get funds. Uh, what's really interesting, I know that there's a lot of Bitcoin maxis here, but if you look, for example, some of the things that Stella did, around some recent natural disasters. I think it's really, really admirable to be able to get these assets into people's hands in a short period of time. Um, so if you Google Stripe Zero Hash, it will pull up, but I just want to say that that's a very, very narrow view of what we think payments with existing payment infrastructure providers can be. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So um, if you Google remittance corridor Mexico US and you search Bitso and search Ripple, you'll be able to see that the so I tried to give the sources on every on every stat that I gave. Um, but um, the key point here is I think there's two there's two key buckets, right? There's the bucket where somebody is buying Bitcoin here and sending Bitcoin to their family in Mexico. That's one use case. The other use case, which is much more predominant and is something that we think will ultimately be the, the ultimate growth lever here, is leveraging this technology stack as the intermediary step. So if you look at this flow of funds here, effectively what is happening is that the customer is sending in dollars. And on the back end, the quickest and simplest way is to actually convert that dollars versus going US dollar Mexican peso. And then they have to hold large amounts of float. There's all these complexity. There's actually effectively two trades. So it's US dollar, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Mexican peso. So that there's two avenues. Um, the second is, I think, where the, the broader set of adoption is going to be coming from, right? You're leveraging this again. Our core view, which I try to stress, is we view this as a technology versus as an asset class. It is definitely an asset, but fundamentally what this is is a technology. And so in the same way that when you go on the internet, some, some people in this room may think about this stuff, but you're not really thinking about the underlying technology. When you send an email, you're not really thinking about the underlying technology. That is what we think is really where the, the, the disruption and innovation will come. Please. Yeah. So I gave one example here. So no one company is going to be able to solve Right? We live in a world with 200 plus countries. So no one com com it's going to require cooperation across different players and different out players. But effectively here, you partner with a local player that either has a local, uh, you, you could even in some ways, right, think of this as maybe potentially a Mexican neobank, for example, right? And if you look at Brazil, new bank offers Bitcoin trading now, right? So they've opened up Bitcoin to 19 million uh, Brazilians. 
So it doesn't necessarily need to be, hey, this gets immediately sent out on a real-time payment mechanism such as SPI. I think the, the story there is that you can actually do a full end-to-end, -end, get it from one bank account to another bank account in another country in under 10 seconds. But this does rely on the proliferation of this technology. And that's why I go back to that point about why Bitcoin is so uniquely placed. It's, you look at, for example, New Bank, uh, you know, the companies that now, you look at Cash App in the US, right? These are companies with hundreds of millions of customers between them. And you look at this technology from the distribution perspective, the number of wallets that have been created. Um, I think that's what's really fundamentally exciting. But it does need that cooperation. It does need that distribution. But Bitcoin is probably the one technology in this space that has got the most amount of, uh, of adoption. Please. Yeah. So I'll start with the second question first. So it is for both retail and institutional, um, but obviously from a retail perspective, it makes it much easier. So the way that Lightning works is that effectively you're creating multiple invoice addresses on every single transaction. Effectively what Uma does, it creates a static uh, thing on top, and that, un that is unique to you. And so if you've ever used, for example, Cash App here in the US, you may see, hey, I have a dollar, and you have your little nickname. You can do the same thing with Uma now. Um, so this is open source technology, um, and it's global. Obviously, this technology, when you're moving funds, is also um, regulated. Um, and so that's the beauty of it, and I think one of the features that we're doing is that we're opening up UMA, right, effectively like an email address for money to all of our partners and many more. So effectively, if our partners decide, they'll be able to distribute this within their own infrastructure as well so that hundreds of millions of people overnight can have the ability to open up an UMA address and that's a static piece that sits on top of the Lightning Network effectively. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. to my country, mm -hmm. and let's say Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Yeah. So do I have to be aware if, if UMA has kind of a business partner with this one that you just created? Yeah, so people will be able to create UMA addresses them, them, themselves, um, and effectively the same way that people can create non-custodial, you know, UMA. So I don't want to bastardize the technology here too much, but effectively, um, I think UMA's will serve two purposes. UMA will, in one sense, serve that use case where the customer isn't even isn't even effectively knowing that, that that intermediate step is going through Bitcoin. But then there's the other piece where you fundamentally know that you're sending Bitcoin from one party to another, um, and that UMA address is ability to connect people across the world, provided that you have effectively ability to create an UMA address. So, maybe one more. Yeah. So, yeah, so in the pure sense of the term, yes, but the second sense of the term is this use case here, where effectively it's that intermediary step. So UMA is being used as that intermediary step so that you don't need to worry about UMA, your cousin doesn't need to worry about UMA, but obviously the beauty of this is that if you do want to, you can also um, do that as well. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have insight into what type of industry those contractors are working with all tech? When you speak to you know potential clients, who who's the client that wants to be paid through Uma? Yeah, so we will we're gonna be releasing this. Um so if you follow us on LinkedIn or X, um it will come out later this month. But we do go into who exactly are the people that are are, are freelancers. Typically these freelancers are people that are tech enabled, uh, are, are, are tech um are, are tech effectively tech workers. That are working, for example, uh, for 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 example, a U.S. company. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, we're trying to whet people's appetite here. So um, yes, yeah, so maybe we'll get a couple more follows. But um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting stat for sure.
or your um, contractor in another like country, and then they give you the email address, and then they send it. He said, no, 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 I, I'm so sorry, I misspelled my email address, mm -hmm. but I, I already sent the money. Mm -hmm. Can you revert the money back? So, if there is no UMA, um, so, so effectively there, there is some validation logic, um, but like anything in crypto, once it's once it's sent, it's 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 it, it's um, it, 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 it's sent. But I think this is why I would view this again as two tracks. One, it's both fundamentally underlined by technology. But the first track is using this as the asset that you are sending. I am sending you Bitcoin on Lightning. And then the second use case is where the infrastructure provider, such as MoneyGram, such as Western Union, such as, for example, there's new startups like Sling, such as Felix Pago, are using this technology more as an intermediary step that abstracts away the complexity. So UMA abstracts away the complexity of sending Bitcoin on network for the user, but using it as the asset that is sent. But I think what is really, really exciting is actually these partners using it as that intermediary step. Exactly, and that's why, like I said, I think this, the bigger lever of this is using this as a fundamental technology and going back to the use case here, well, effectively, customer is sending, the sender is sending dollars and the recipient is receiving Mexican peso for exactly the reasons that you articulate. Yeah, I, I don't have the exact speed, but if you look at, for example, if you just look at right now and you just say, what's the cost of sending 100, if Google, what's the cost of sending $100 on Bitcoin network right now, what's the cost of sending $100 on Lightning, it, it will be cheaper on Lightning. Yeah. 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 Right, any last questions? Yeah, please. So what is like Mona's got her Uma exchange in Mexico, how does she spend that Mexican peso? Does she have a debit card to Mexican Gratify? Yeah, so, so I think this is the, this just goes back to the question around who sits on the other side. And this has to be a collaboration. And so, for example, in Mexico, one of the largest exchanges there, um, again, a company actually that was founded in Boston as well, is Bitso. So, for example, if Bitso is enabled, um, you can do all of the local payment methods. I don't know if they have a debit card yet, but if you look at, for example, like I said, the example in, um, in Brazil, um, when you're a new bank customer, if you send your Bitcoin, you can then convert that into a Brazilian real, and then you have your new bank credit card or debit card. Right, so right here, Alex has money in a country in Mexico. Mm -hmm. He wants to buy groceries with a certain set of Mexican pesos. How yeah. does he do that in Mexico? Using the existing infrastructure that she already has. So, so that, that dollar is sitting in either a neobank, a traditional bank, a provider. I'm not saying that this is, we're 100% there yet. We need more adoption. We need more of this piece. But if you actually look at, for example, the largest fintech in Mexico that have adopted this, it's covering a large part of the Mexican population. If you're looking at the crypto native firms that have been created like Bitso, it covers an even greater percentage of the population. Same thing in Colombia, same thing in Brazil. And that's partly what we're also trying to do as well, is provide, if you look at our customer base, they are largely traditional players. So what we think is really interesting is open up access to the companies that have 100 million customers today and making it really, really seamless for the exact reasons that people have articulated. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. And if you want to find me, it's just edward at zerohash.com. Thank you all. All right, thank you, Edward. Next, we're going to have Adam Jones from Chaincode uh, speaking us on the why became a Bitcoin open source dev. So, so, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about why to choose a career in Bitcoin open source. Um, my name is Adam Jonas. I work at Chaincode Labs. Chaincode Labs is a research and development shop in New York City. Um, we've been around for about 10 years. We were started by an MIT grad, Alec Mur Alex Murkos, and his co-founder, Suas Daftuar. It's a small team of 12. We have no product. We have no revenue. Um, people are hired to write the software that should exist in the world. 
and that makes Bitcoin um, and, and, and our particular contribution to it, I think, pretty special. So um, we simply exist to make Bitcoin better. So people um, often ask what a CEO does at a company with no product or revenue. Um, it's an uh, increasingly common and somewhat insulting question, um, but it, it's fair. Um, the, the answer is, in the last week, I've been thinking about this talk. Um, this, is my sec this is my second rewrite of this talk. Um, and the first one I thought was pretty funny, um, but I ran it by a friend, and he said, it wasn't that funny. Um, but I think, I think this is compelling, and I think um, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to consider a career in Bitcoin open source. So today, I'm here on a unicorn hunt. 